you've got your Bibles, uh, I want to invite you to go to the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be in Mark 9 this morning. Uh, Mark 9, beginning with verse 2. A couple weeks ago, um, when there were still uh, Thanksgiving uh, leftovers in your refrigerator, I noticed uh, that uh, Christmas lights started popping up uh, around the community. Uh, in the neighborhoods, uh, in even across the world. And so there's uh, Bloomington uh, Christmas lights, there's normal Christmas lights. Uh, and as I shared last week, uh, people put up Christmas lights uh, literally all over the world in places that you might not expect. So, for example, the one down in the middle, uh, down below there, that's in Germany, and you'd probably be like, well, of course they put up Christmas lights there. Um, but the one in the upper left-hand corner, uh, that is Tokyo, Japan. And of course, they are not a Christian country. Uh, and maybe even more surprising is in Riyadh, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, the one on the right. Um, they even put up Christmas lights there. So what's with all the lights? Why do we put up these Christmas lights? Some people before Thanksgiving, uh, most people uh, after Thanksgiving. And so during this Advent season, we have been having this conversation about Christmas lights. What's with all the lights? And what I've discovered is, uh, while a lot of people don't really know why they put up Christmas lights, uh, they just do it, right? Um, the Bible has a lot to say about Christmas lights and the light of Jesus Christ uh, come into the world. So we began this Advent journey a couple weeks ago. We looked at a passage from the Gospel of John. Last weekend, uh, we looked at a passage from Matthew. And today, we are looking at this uh, passage from the Gospel of Mark. And this is a very familiar story, uh, again, about the light of Christ, the light uh, from heaven come into the world. And you probably know this story. It's a familiar story of uh, Jesus and a couple of his buddies. They go hiking up a mountain. And as, when they get up to the top of the mountain, all of a sudden there is this mysterious and really bright light. And they were confused and they were perplexed and they were afraid. They were afraid. And so this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about what it means to experience the light of Jesus Christ, even when we're afraid, when there's so much fear going on in the world. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for an opportunity to worship you this morning, to celebrate your goodness, your faithfulness, and to reflect on your word as our Christmas lights all around us. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable. For you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this past week, uh, I was sharing with my wife while we're out driving around looking at Christmas lights, sharing with her a little bit about what I was going to share with you all this, this morning. And she said, you're not really going to tell that story, are you? And I said, yeah, I am. She said, you are going to freak everybody out. Nobody's going to come back to Faith Lutheran Church. They are going to think you're strange. She said, you cannot tell them about that freaky phenomenon. My wife called me a freaky phenomenon. Let me give you a little backstory. A couple of years ago, I was out running uh, one evening, and as I'm running along, all of a sudden, the light above me went dark. I didn't think too much about it. I ran a little further along, and the light above me, which was lit up, went dark. I keep running, and a light that was not lit up turned on. The street lights are messing with me. And I don't mean street lights way down the street. I mean when I'm standing directly underneath them. They go out, boom, just all of a sudden. Or it's dark, and all of a sudden they pop on. It's very strange. And uh, this happened you know, a couple times while I would go running. Actually, very consistently, very regularly, uh, I would run anywhere between four and five miles. And this would happen six, seven, eight times. Never way up ahead, never way behind, but right when I was standing below the street light. And I was kind of freaked out about this. And I didn't want to tell my wife about it because I thought she would think I was nuts and you know, admit me to the hospital or something. 
So I called the city of Bloomington. And I explained what was going on. And I said, surely there is a scientific explanation for what's going on. And the guy at the Department of Public Works was silent. He said, nope. No scientific explanation. But you're not the first person to call and explain what's going on. I thought, well, well, good. There are other freaks uh, out in the community in Bloomington Normal like me running around uh, spontaneously turning lights off and on uh, whenever we're directly uh, underneath the streetlight. So at that point in time, I was, I was able to kind of work up enough courage to tell my wife what was going on. And she thought I was nuts. But I said, hey, the guy at City Hall said I wasn't the first person to call. So apparently there's a couple of us around town. This is going on. And so we didn't know what to do with it. And so we did what you probably would do is we went to our friend Google to see if this was really a thing. If it was just in Bloomington or if this is really a thing. Well, here's what you need to know. It's really a thing. In fact, it is called street light interference syndrome. True. And the acronym is SLI. So some people, oh yeah, I got SLI syndrome. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a recovering SLI uh, person, you know, or I, I don't know how this works. But we investigated this and there's reports in all sorts of different newspapers uh, and articles about this street light interference syndrome. And uh, there's even a book uh, called Sliders, S-L-I-Ders, Sliders. And this book is written by a guy in England, a guy by the name of Hillary Evans, uh, and he talks, and so I love the, the, the subtitle, The Enigma of Streetlight Interference. And what he does is he takes these, these case studies of 215 people around the world who have experiences just like me. And there's no, he, he describes this, he says there is no scientific basis for this at all. In fact, if you want to purchase this book, you would find it in the paranormal section at Barnes & Noble. It's true. I'm a slider. Your pastor is a slider. Now to be clear, I can't control this. I don't look up at the street lights and say, come on, or turn off. It just happens spontaneously. It's very freaky. It's very crazy. And so my wife and I were driving down College Avenue this past week, and she says, well, does it still happen to you? I kid you not. The very next street light that we drove under, we looked up, and it went out. (laughs) Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do
Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except for Jesus. And you've probably heard this story many, many times. This, of course, is what we call the the transfiguration. And if you're a hardcore uh, liturgical calendar person, you're probably irritated right now because this is usually read uh, the Sunday before Ash Wednesday, right? Those of you liturgical people, you're like, why are we reading about the transfiguration in Advent? It's not the right liturgical season of the year. That's all right. We're reading them a little out of order. Last week, uh, we we looked at uh, Epiphany, right? And some of you were irritated about that. Uh, You didn't say anything to me, but I I could tell. Because some of you you just don't, you know, I move your cheese when it comes to, uh, you know, the liturgical calendar. But this, of course, is something we usually read uh, in the wintertime, just before Ash Wednesday, just before we head into the season of Lent. And we read it every year. It's a familiar text. This is what Matthew says to kind of add a little color and texture to it. Jesus' face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, my mom said, don't look up at the sun, you'll go blind, right? So what do I do? I look up at the sun. And it's just so bright, right? It just, and then you close your eyes, and you can still see these rings, you know, just <laughs> pulsating. Am I the only one that's done this? Anybody else ever looked at the sun and you weren't supposed to do it? Yeah, so, okay. And it says he became white as light. And, and so, you know, what does that even mean? Um, you know, there's the sun. What, what does it even mean? I mean, look at the, He's glowing. And we can't hardly even imagine this, this, this whole idea of, of, of Jesus glowing and the sun and bleach and, and, and bright light. This is how Luke describes it. The appearance of Jesus' face changed. His clothes became bright as a flash of lightning. Now, there was lightning uh, Friday night. I don't know if you saw lightning in the sky. And I don't think this is the kind of lightning uh, that Luke is talking about. I think he's talking about that lightning that flashes right outside your house. It startles you because it's so bright. And, of course, there's some kind of thunder that goes with it. And if you've ever, you know, experienced that, just that flash of lightning is just like, ah. And so this is how Luke describes it. There's all these different interpretations of what is going on with the transfiguration. And so I want to, again, I give you, this is kind of what we think of when we think of the transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, they're just like, oh, what is going on? And I love that, um, uh, that, that uh, Mark just describes it as Jesus was transfigured before them. As if the language of transfiguration is a normal thing. Right? I mean, it's, it's such a strange word. Uh, and frankly, I don't know of any other context this is word uh, transfiguration is used in, except J.K. Rowling's uh, Harry Potter, right? Remember, Mrs. McGonagall uh, even teaches a class called Transfiguration. I think it's so interesting that J.K. Rowling picks up on this idea of something that's so strange, so bizarre, and, she, and so she teaches a class on it to Harry and, uh, and his friends there at Hogwarts. But we don't use this word anywhere. Here, I, there's, there's uh, Mrs. McGonagall's uh, blackboard describing, and, and, and basically the class is just about changing something from one thing to another. But it's so much more than that. The definition of a transfiguration or something that is transfigured is a complete change of form or appearance into a more beautiful or spiritual state. And I can't think of any other example apart from the Bible where we talk about something is transfigured. Something is changed in such a way from something so normal into something divine, something that is glowing where there's, there's bleach and lightning and all these things. And so it's truly an extraordinary occurrence that is going on, a supernatural occurrence. And then Mark writes this, Peter did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Of course they were frightened. 
Nobody's ever seen a transfiguration before. Have you ever seen a transfiguration before? All of a sudden, someone's standing there, glowing, divine before you. There's this flash of lightning. Of course they were terrified. I think it's so interesting that Jesus' closest friends were in the presence of God, in the presence of their good friend Jesus, and they are afraid. And I read this story, and I take some comfort in it. Because I think as us, as Jesus followers, people who walk with Christ day in and day out, we still experience fear, even though Jesus is with us. And oftentimes we are fearful of things that we don't understand. How many of you, I just, just by the way, how many of you think I totally made up that story about uh, streetlight interference before? That's, that's pretty weird. Yeah, okay, there's one honest answer, right? Some of you are not meant, you guys really trust me. I don't think I would believe me. I mean, this happens to me. This happened to me last night. And I'm not sure, and then I, I had to think to myself, is this really happening? I'm not sure I even believe me. But this is what's going on in the story. And things that we don't understand as we become afraid. Because we don't know what to do with it. And fear is so much a part of our lives. Fear is so much a part of our world today. Even for us as Christians, even for those of us who walk with Jesus. This past week I learned that the American Psychological Association said that 2020 was the most stressful year on record, according to them. Anxiety and fear were rampant. That was 2020. It was just a year where anxiety and stress and fear were everywhere, right? And in this article, they were saying that 2021 has shown very little improvement. We are still a nation who is gripped by fear. Even those of us who are Jesus followers, why are we so afraid And so I thought just for fun, we'd look at the top 10 uh, list here from the American Psychological Association. Number one, uh, loved ones dying. We're afraid of our loved ones dying. We're afraid of loved ones becoming ill. We're afraid of mass shootings. We're afraid of not having enough money for retirement. We're afraid of terrorism. We're afraid of government corruption. We're afraid of becoming terminally ill. We're afraid of hate crimes. We're afraid of medical bills. We're afraid of widespread civil unrest. And this week we learned that we are also afraid of inflation, right? Because there's just the, the, the bad news keeps going and going. And now as of Friday, apparently we're, we're also afraid of tornadoes, right? That come through. And can you imagine being, by the way, in an Amazon warehouse doing what you do and all of a sudden the roof caves in and all that stuff? I mean, it's, it's kind of freaky, right? I mean, there's a lot to be afraid of uh, for sure. In fact, another study I read uh, this week is that 60% of Americans say, I'm afraid or I'm very afraid. 60% of Americans are like, yep, that's me. So I want us to camp out on this idea a little bit this morning of why are we so afraid, even those of us who have the light of Jesus Christ in our lives. Why are we so afraid? And so I went to my friend Webster um, to really learn a little bit more about what's going on with fear. And I think this definition helps a little bit to explain Webster the Dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, if you will, uh, this, this, de- this definition. Fear is a distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, evil, pain, etc. Whether the threat is real or imagined. Did you hear that? The threat doesn't even have to be real. It can just be imagined. It can be fake, a fake threat, and we are still afraid. And I think that's really interesting because we can be afraid of all sorts of things that just don't exist except for in our imagination. Now, neuroscientists tell us that all of us are only born with two innate fears. We are only born with the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. That's it. All the rest of our fears are learned. So whether it's mice or snakes, heights, darkness, enclosed spaces, roller coasters, I don't know what your fears are. 
They are learned fears. You were not born with those fears, which is hard for me to believe. Because when I see a snake, I have an unbelievable uh, uh, re- emotional reaction. My boys will go walking over and pick up the snake and, and be, hey, look at that. I see a snake and I am running the other direction, a thousand miles an hour. I lose my vision. Everything goes blurry. I, I stop breathing. I, I just have this reaction. I am so terrified of snakes. But neuroscientists say, I I learned that somewhere. I developed that somewhere. But we all wrestle with fears in our lives. Public speaking. I don't have that freaky uh, fear, I guess, apparently. I guess I'm, you know, a slider and I'm also a public speaker. But most people fear public speaking. A lot of people fear death. Again, neuroscientists tell us there's nothing to fear. You, You learned that fear. You were not born with that fear. I think what this tells us is that whatever fears you might be experiencing, we place them on objects out there. We say things like, I'm afraid of spiders. I'm afraid of snakes. I'm afraid of the dark. Uh, I'm afraid of public speaking. I'm afraid of death. But those are not accurate statements. The reality is fear is within us. We've just placed that on objects around us and said those things are scary. In reality, fear is from within. It says a whole lot more about us. Of course, the world right now is dealing with COVID. We got to be honest. COVID is not our fear. The fear is within us and the ways in which we are dealing with this fear. Psychologists tell us that this is actually confirmation bias. And confirmation bias, as you probably know, is that you go looking for evidence, you go looking for science, you go looking for data to support whatever you already think. And then some of you can come to me, and some of you have come to me, and you've given me all sorts of data points to explain to me why you're afraid and why I should be afraid. But the reality is, if you're afraid, that says more about you than the actual what's going on, the object of your fear. See, what I've learned is many people long before COVID show up, they were already afraid. We live in a dangerous world. You know that? There is a lot, before COVID showed up, before the Delta variant, there were lots of other diseases that could kill you. You know that. It's just that we thought the world was a safer place, and so we kind of go through life. The world is not a safe place. There are many diseases out there that will kill you. Many of you know that I run. I I find it so interesting. The drivers in Bloomington Normal are the craziest drivers on the planet. I don't get it. Why is everybody in this community in such a hurry to go places? When I'm out running, I think to myself, I'm far more likely to get hit by a car by these crazy Bloomington normal drivers than I am to die by COVID. Do you know last week, two pedestrians were killed walking across the street in this community? And we weren't, we're not freaking out about that, right? But I mean, just these two people woke up one day, walking around across the street, boom, they're dead. Why are we not freaking out about that? Media continues to tell us to be afraid, to be very afraid. Now, I'm not saying COVID's not real. I'm not saying we shouldn't be careful. I'm not saying we shouldn't take, you know, appropriate actions and and be smart about this. But when we are so locked up in fear, as if this is the only thing that's going to kill us, as if this is the only thing that's going to get us, we have lost our minds. We have allowed fear to take over in our lives. 18 months ago, people would ask, ask me, you know, when, when we were all experiencing COVID for the first time and, and the quarantine, and people would say to me, hey, what do you think about all this? And I'm like, well, first of all, I'm not a scientist. I don't know. Two, I think it's a very confusing and interesting time. And I think one of the interesting things about COVID, and especially with the quarantine, 
is that the behaviors of both a hero and a coward or a coward and a hero look the same. If you are planning on being a hero through the quarantine, what you are supposed to do is stay home. If you are a coward, your behavior is to stay home. And so the behaviors of whether you're a hero or a coward looks the same. And I think that's been one of the confusing things for all of us as we've kind of navigated through uh, COVID and the quarantine is, is who is that person? Are they afraid or are they a hero? I don't know, because the behavior looks the same. And I think the more as we, we kind of move through this and, and kind of turn a page on, on where this is all going, I think we're starting to have some honest conversations with ourselves. What's my motivation for staying home? What's my motivation for hiding? What's my motivation for all that's going on? And the thing is, I don't think it's anybody else's job to judge anybody else's motivation. For some people, the most courageous, heroic thing they can do is to stay home, to stay away from people. For other people, the most courageous, heroic thing they can do is to go out. And so now we're in this season where, you know, we all got used to staying home and and kind of trying to figure all this thing out. Now, all of a sudden, behavior has gotten really confusing again. And I want to encourage us as a congregation, as a community of faith, to love people, to care for people, to not judge other people and their motivations. There are things about them that we don't know. And so we got to love them and care for them as we're examining our own motivations. So where does this idea of fear come from in the Bible? We go to the Bible. Gee, where, where in the world is, where, where does fear begin? Well, it's interesting. Fear actually shows up in Genesis 3. Isn't that great? We as human beings, we are overachievers. We just took us three chapters all of a sudden to experience of fear in the Bible. And uh, Genesis 1, we didn't really exist yet, Right? So by Genesis 3, all of a sudden, there is fear. And you know this story. Adam and Eve, they sinned. They messed up. They ate from the forbidden fruit. And then all of a sudden, they're ashamed. And they decide to hide from God. And this is what it says in Genesis 3. Adam says, I heard you in the garden, God, and I was afraid because I was naked And so I hid. There's where fear is. Early on in the Bible. It's part of our just our our instinct. I think Adam and Eve hid because they felt inadequate. They were ashamed of themselves. They were exposed. So they hid. I think oftentimes when we feel fear in our lives, I think it's because we feel inadequate. We feel exposed. I got to tell you, every Sunday morning, as I'm getting ready to come into church to stand before you all, I'm feeling exposed. I feel fearful. And I want to stay home. And I want to hide like Adam and Eve. It's very common, I think, when we experience and we feel fear. See, if you live your life and fear controls you, that fear is just always right here. But the truth is, if you live your life courageously, you still feel fear. Whether you live fearfully or you live courageously, you cannot get around fear. It's from the very beginning of Scripture when God made us. And people have been feeling fear Ever since. So, what is fear? Fear is an emotion. Fear is an emotion. Fear is not a behavior. It can manifest itself in a behavior, but it doesn't have to. Fear is an emotion. 
courage is a behavior. I think of one of the most famous stories in the Bible in the Old Testament is a guy by the name of Joshua, where God comes to Joshua, and Joshua is afraid. God didn't say to Joshua, uh, be strong and courageous because he was already courageous. He said that because he was fearful. See, fear is a part of who we are in our daily experience. So God says to Joshua, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Courage is a choice. Nobody wakes up and says, I'm going to be, I feel courageous today. The person who behaves courageously, they are still feeling fear in their lives. Now, if you know people who are like, oh, uh, he's courageous, he feels courageous, there's something wrong with that person, right? We all can probably think of people who are feeling courageous. If you feel courageous, you probably shouldn't be doing what you're doing. You should feel fear. And then lean into that fear and live with courage. I think a better way of us understanding and leaning into fear, leaning into this fear and living courage is this idea of of fear and love. That love drives out the fear in our lives. John writes this in 1 John 4.18. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. I love that. So we don't need to just focus or obsess around the fear. We don't need to obsess or focus, even frankly, around the courage. But when we really focus on God's love, that's when the fear disappears. That's when the fear goes away. God's perfect love drives out fear. You know, I've been married for 28 years, um, and Sydney and I have good days and bad days. Uh, When we have bad days, uh, it's usually my fault uh, that we have bad days. So uh, she more or less puts up with me. And I know there um, are many days that Cindy doesn't like me, and uh, I'm not very likable some days. I get it, right? But I tell you what, uh, I, I know that she loves me. I know that she loves me. And because I know that she loves me, it prevents me from doing lots of really making bad decisions, doing dumb things, right? See, when you have the confidence of love in your life, it just helps you to kind of relax a little bit, right? You know when you are around someone who loves you, someone who loves you unconditionally, you're just like, yeah, I screwed up, I messed up. You don't all of a sudden go, ah, I don't know if they're going to love me anymore, right? But you also know when you're around someone who loves you conditionally. That's a different thing, right? That stresses you out because your love is based on something. And of course, this is God's love for us. We need to remind ourselves over and over and over that God's love for each one of us is perfect, that we don't need to be stressed out. We don't need to fear uh, that God is going to stop liking us. Love is really the solution as we think about all the ways in which you are navigating fear in the world. And we invite that love to come into our lives. It changes us. It changes our actions and our behavior, and it begins to look like courage. Many years ago, when I was in my early 20s, I was a lifeguard uh, at Lake Hiawatha uh, in South Minneapolis. And I, I dug up an old picture uh, to show you all. I'm the one on the left. <laughs> now nah, I couldn't find an old picture. So I just found somebody who kind of looked like me. Uh, no, nah, not that either. But you get the idea. You know what a lifeguard looks like, right? I just thought, you know... Just kind of set the stage there a little bit. But uh, I was a lifeguard, and uh, it, was, it was great fun. It was really interesting. And I remember one time when I was lifeguarding at Lake Hiawatha. I'd been guarding all day. It was hot, uh, middle of summer in South Minneapolis. Uh, and I looked off to the side, just outside the boundaries uh, for where the swimming area was. There was a buoy down there. And I noticed that there was somebody kind of jumping up and down uh, in the water close to the shore. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. They're outside of the boundaries. Not my responsibility, right? But I'll just keep an eye on them because I am the lifeguard. I'm out here, so I'm going to pay attention. 
So a couple minutes go by, and, and, and the sun is starting to set a little bit, or it's going down, and so now I'm looking into the sun. I've got sunglasses on, like my friend Dwayne, and you know I'm kind of looking, and, and it's hot, and I'm tired, and I can kind of barely see. And this person is still jumping up and down just outside the boundary uh, of the swimming area. And so I thought, well, I better go check it out. So uh, I climb down off of my lifeguard perch, uh, and I start walking across the sand, and before I can just barely put my feet on the sand, this person just goes racing by me, sprinting uh, like a thousand miles an hour, and they go running over, and they pull their child out of the water where there was a drop-off. This child was drowning. See, in my mind as a lifeguard, I cared But I didn't have the kind of care and love that that dad had. See, that dad, on that day, I mean, I was dressed like like a lifeguard, not like that, but pretty close. This dad had on shoes, he had on clothes, and he went racing right into the water. And as I'm walking over there, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to go check this out. I'm going to have to yell at this kid for, for, you know, swimming outside the, 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 the designated area and all that good stuff. But not the dad. He just went racing right in the water and pulled his kid out. Because that's what love does. Love does not sit and think. Love doesn't sit and assess. Love doesn't kind of meander. Love makes a beeline when somebody needs to be rescued. That's the kind of love God has for you. God's not looking at you wondering, ah, I wonder if I like them, I wonder if I love them, I wonder how their behavior's been today. God's love for you is so profound that he's making a beeline for you. He is coming to rescue you every single day of your life. That's what love does. And every parent in this room or or tuning in online understands that. This is what we do as parents is we just love and we just go and and we'll think later and we'll figure out all the other details later. Right now, it's time for action. And so right now, I want you to know, whatever you think about yourself, what other you think other people might think about you, God's not thinking those things. He loves you. He wants to rescue you and be a part of your life. I think that's pretty good news. And I think as us Jesus followers, as we think about the light of Christ come into the world, back to the Christmas lights. Whether you know it or not, whether the people who own this house know it or not, I think this is a great image, a great symbol all over our community and all over the world, that it's a dark place, that it's a sinful place, that it's a broken place. And that Jesus Christ has come into the world to rescue you and to rescue me. And it's kind of freaky. We're not sure what to do with it. Because Jesus does some pretty crazy stuff. He says some really crazy stuff. It's a mystery. And we're maybe even afraid if Jesus will love us enough. He says, I can handle it. It's okay. You can be afraid. It's okay. But receive my love in the midst of your fear. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that you are a God in spite of our fears, in spite of our insecurities. Um, You come to us and you invite us into a relationship with you. Lord, as um, we travel through this season of, of Advent, we see lights all around us. God, we don't understand We don't understand why there's so much brokenness, so much hatred, so much meanness going on in the world. That's the world into which you came, God. And so, Lord, help us to receive you this Advent season, this Christmas season. And help us to not just receive you, but help us, God, to also be that light that shines to others. So, Lord, in the midst of the fear, in the midst of the mystery, in the midst of all we don't understand. 
shine brightly in our lives and shine brightly in this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.